Thanks very much for having me here to, to talk to you today. Um, as mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the, the newly uh, finalized uh, recovery strategy for Boreal Caribou. And a little bit of uh, an outline just to talk about the caribou in Canada and what types there are, uh, distribution of Boreal Caribou, what the roles of the federal and provincial governments are in the recovery of Boreal Caribou in Canada, a little bit about the Species at Risk Act, some comments we received on the proposed uh, recovery strategy, and um, the final recovery strategy, how it, how it looks and what's changed from the proposed version that you might be more familiar with. Oh no. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so as mentioned, uh, I started my career working on bison, and there's wooden plains bison, and it's nice and simple, and now I'm working on caribou, and it's it's far from simple as far as the, the number of species and ecotypes and everything else there are. But so what we're working, we're, we're interested in today is, is woodland caribou, which is a, a subspecies of caribou. And there are uh, about six different types of woodland caribou. One of them is boreal caribou, which uh, occurs throughout most of uh, the provinces and territories in Canada. And some other fairly common ones are northern mountain and southern mountain caribou. And there's actually, because is now recommended a, a third um, mountain type, central mountain caribou. And then the other ones mainly occur farther east, the Atlantic, Newfoundland, and migratory forest tundra caribou. And this is where they all live. Um, so the, the green here is the boreal caribou that we're, I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, usually when people talk, think about caribou, they think about these large herds of migratory animals that uh, occur in farther north and so these are the supposed to be the barren ground caribou up in this sort of blue patched area. Um, other interesting ones I guess in Alberta so they do have some of the cellar mountain caribou as well. So this is this is the area that we have to deal with when we're talking about the recovery of boreal caribou in Canada. And the important thing to note is that there's been a, certainly a, a northern movement in the uh, southern part of the range of boreal caribou in Canada. So we're talking about the, the roles and responsibilities of the federal and provincial governments. So most of what the federal government has to do is, is decide under the Species at Risk Act. So under the Species at Risk Act, we have to develop a recovery strategy, which we've just done and just published. We also are responsible for uh, developing at least one action plan for boreal caribou and any other listed species. And we also try to have to try to identify a critical habitat to the extent possible. Now, uh, CERA includes provisions to try to protect species at risk and critical <coughs> habitat. And these are applied differently depending on whether the species is on federal or non-federal lands. So for federal lands, as defined under the Species at Risk Act. The Government of Canada has to ensure that the species is legally protected under federal law. And if there are no federal laws in place to, to legally protect critical habitat, then the Species at Risk Act requires that the minister gets an order in place to provide this protection for critical habitat. In the cases where critical habitat is found on non-federal lands, uh, Environment Canada would first look to the provinces uh, to effectively protect the species to see if they have laws in place that would uh, protect critical habitat. And if critical habitat is not effectively protected under these, uh, under any existing law for the provinces, then Species at Risk Act requires that we uh, write a report every 180 days showing what the province is doing to try to protect critical habitat. And depending on the progress that we write about in these reports, uh, it may the minister may form the opinion that critical habitat is not being effectively protected, and if this is the case, then he has to recommend to cabinet that a safety order, uh, safety net order, be put in place to protect the species and some or all of its critical habitat. Cabinet doesn't have to accept the safety order, but the minister does have to recommend to cabinet that the safety order be put in place. So the, the provinces then, if you think about that, that slide, 
going to try to go back here. So most of the uh, land that boreal caribou occur on is actually provincially managed land. So as a consequence for that, uh, provinces and territories have a very large role in, in trying to protecting boreal caribou and the critical habitat on, on non-federal lands, which is most of the range of, of boreal caribou. And the provinces and territories are also responsible for the day-to-day -day management of boreal caribou. Uh, most provinces and territories have developed or are in the process of developing uh, recovery plans for boreal caribou within their jurisdiction. So because of this, we have this uh, Species Risk Act, which the uh, federal government has some responsibilities under, and the provinces are responsible for the day-to-day -day management of caribou and protecting caribou and critical habitat on most of the land. So we have to try to work together and, and develop a nationally consistent framework to uh, manage and recover boreal caribou across Canada. So this is our, uh, our listing of basically the process that we go through for protecting caribou in Canada. So first off, there's this assessment process and in 2000, and again 2002, Kosiwik assessed boreal caribou was threatened and the reason for this is that they said the boreal uh, populations have decreased throughout most of the range. They're threatened from habitat loss and increased predation, the latter possibly facilitated by human activities. Once that happened, there was, there's the listing process and Species Risk Act actually only came into proclamation in 2003. And at that time, all of the uh, species that were recommended by Pacific to be listed were automatically listed at the proclamation of Ocera, including boreal caribou. Then we go into the recovery planning stage, and this is where we develop this recovery strategy for boreal caribou, and then move into the sort of development of action planning stages. And we haven't quite uh, worked this out with all the provinces and territories yet, but uh, one likely scenario is that one action plan is developed for every jurisdiction, so every province and territory would have their own action plan. And, uh, sorry, so then we go into the implementation phase where we develop these range plans and action plans and start actually doing on the ground, on the ground work to try to recover boreal caribou. Then there's evaluation. How is everything that we're doing uh, to try to recover boreal caribou working? And back into the assessment process, so Kosiwik is um, uh, continuously or periodically looking at all the species that they recommend to be listed. And we also look at our recovery strategies every five years to uh, to update them and um, uh, see how the species are doing. So this recovery strategy then has uh, a number of different uh, different aspects to it. There's um, a description of the species and its needs. It identifies threats to the species and threats to the species habitat. There is population distribution objectives. So this is basically outlines how we know when a species is recovered. Uh, identification of the species critical habitat to the extent possible and approaches to stop or reverse the decline of the species. So this proposed Boreal Care Recovery Strategy stuff that I've mentioned a few times was posted on the Species at Risk Public Registry in August 26, 2011. Uh, usually these are posted for, I believe, it's 60 days, but we had an extended comment period for this species uh, that ended February 22, 2012. One of the main reasons for that we extended this public comment period was uh, because it's a, a species that has a very broad range and it's a species that's of interest to a lot of different groups and that was certainly um, reflected in the number of comments that were received on this proposed recovery strategy. We had over 19,000 comments received in, including close to 200 uh, original unique detailed submissions. And in comparison, I think the average is usually about five and I, our record was about 200, I think, before before this uh, document was released on the public registry. Another thing we did during this time is we contacted about uh, 200, over 260 Aboriginal communities uh, within the range or near the range of Boreal Caribou throughout throughout Canada, and 87 of these communi communities requested that we have uh, sort of more face-to-face -face meetings, and so we had 
those going on, and a, a good chunk of those 87 communities were within uh, my range, which is Elbert, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. <coughs> so we got all these comments, and then we had to look at all these comments. Uh, so there's a systematic review and analysis of, of all these comments, and appropriate revisions to the recovery strategy took place. And then the final recovery strategy is posted on the Species of Risk Public Registry October 5th, 2012. So I guess about six, seven weeks ago. So what we, the main things that we heard um, from these 19,000 comments is that the population distribution objectives should not prioritize recovery of certain local populations. What that's coming from is that we had self-sustaining and non-self-sustaining herds, and we sort of had the recovery for the non-self-sustaining herds, um, uh, sort of a two-tiered process where we had some that we were going to try to make self-sustaining and some that we were just going to try stabilizing. So we heard a lot of comments about how that uh, people didn't think that was appropriate. Um, there were a lot of comments about the 60% probability of self-sustainability being problematic, and so that's our uh, that's sort of our, our goal for how we say we have a self-sustaining herd is it has a 60% probability of being self-sustaining over 20 years. Range delineation needs updating. We heard a lot, uh, that comment a lot. Um, there were some concerns that the recovery strategy and the engagement process were an infringement on Aboriginal and treaty rights. And there was a lot of uh, concern in, in Saskatchewan that uh, the northern Saskatchewan situation is unique. And in this, in northern Saskatchewan, they have a uh, very high fire, natural fire regime. And it's uh, one of the highest that we see in, in the range of northern caribou in Canada. At the same time, they have a very low anthropogenic disturbance. It's about 2 to 5%. And because of that, there was concerns that the, the model that was developed didn't necessarily apply to that situation. Some other additional comments we heard that um, uh, pollution, noise, and, and uh, climate change were important threats, which we hadn't necessarily had in the proposed recovery strategy or hadn't uh, um, uh, commented on enough. Uh, we heard that the crit critical habitat concept was too prescriptive. We heard that uh, the recovery strategy needs a revision as it appears to want to protect industrial development to the detriment of boreal caribou. And we heard that the efficacy of predator management is questionable. So some comments that uh, we got from the oil and gas industry were fairly similar to what we just talked about, but uh, a need to reaffirm provincial and territorial jurisdiction over wildlife management to make it clear that uh, who is responsible for what in the recovery strategy. Uh, the oil and gas industry, uh, most of the comments that we received supported the goal of recovering a national population of boreal caribou. Uh, potentially recognizing the fact that action plans may conclude that the recovery of some local populations is not biologically or, or technically feasible. Right now the recovery strategy does say that uh, recovery of caribou is biologically and technically feasible throughout the range. Uh, there, we heard some comments that there's a need for consideration of socioeconomics within the, uh, within, the, uh, within the document, which we can't really do under the Species Risk Act that says that the recovery strategies do not look at socioeconomics. And there was support for flexibility in predator management and habitat management tools as option for uh, uh, recovery and, and management. So what we did then with all of these comments is that within uh, uh, the new recovery strategy, uh, it does have more of a clarification for the lead roles of provinces and territories throughout most of the range of, of Port of Caribou as their managing land and, and managing wildlife. We now have two population distribution objectives um, instead of the three that we had before. And these population distribution objectives are to either maintain or recover all of the populations to self-sustaining status to the extent possible. We want to restore boreal caribou habitat in areas where it is currently highly disturbed and avoid constraints to development in areas that are unused by boreal caribou. So we sort of changed how we define critical habitat, and I'll talk about that more later. And we did do an update on range boundaries uh, based on the new information that was made available to us from jurisdictions. And we actually had changed the number of uh, local populations. We now have 51 local populations of uh, boreal caribou in Canada. 
and this is where they all are. <coughs> biggest changes, um, biggest changes were in Saskatchewan. We used to have eight populations in Saskatchewan. Now, now we have two, uh, sort of a, a plains, a boreal plains and a boreal shield population. There were some minor changes in Alberta to where the ranges are. And this AB1 here, uh, Chinchaga, used to actually have be two populations. There's a little deadwood population here. And we've amalgamated that into one. Uh, those are the, the main changes around in, in the prairie provinces, anyways. Um, so we also committed in the recovery strategy to look at the range, the delineation, population demographic, in, in, uh, sorry, information, and integrated risk assessments uh, annually and update the recovery strategy uh, if we need to in, in the context of these three. So we have these self-sustaining and non-self-sustaining herds. Um, we, what we want to do is try to recover all herds to self-sustaining levels to the extent possible. Right now there are 14 self-sustaining uh, herds throughout Canada. Uh, these are the green herds and there's 29 non-self-sustaining and 8 that could go either way. They're either self-sustaining or not self-sustaining based on the modeling work that we did. And we've sort of lumped those in with not self-sustaining right now. And what you can see is that in Alberta and Saskatchewan, uh, most of the herds are, in fact, I think all of the herds are not self-sustaining. And then in Manitoba, we get we started getting a few more self-sustaining. And as we move further east and further north, there are more self-sustaining herds. So this critical habitat, then we have a sort of a new way for identifying critical habitat. And what it says is that. What we're looking at for is the, the area in each boreal cable range that allows ongoing recruitment and retirement cycle of habitat. So allowing for the fact that uh, what is critical habitat and what's habitat is important to care can change over time. But we have to maintain a perpetual state of a minimum 65% of the area as undisturbed habitat. So this is what our uh, what critical habitat is. And we also are acknowledging in there that biophysical attributes required by boreal care to carry out life processes. So we have this um, we're acknowledging that not all habitat within the range of, of boreal caribou meets this biophysical attribute de uh, uh, definition and is important for caribou. So there's three main aspects for critical habitat. Location and mountain type. So location is the range boundary. So what we said is that critical habitat should be looked at at the range level. So we have 51 different ranges where we're looking at critical habitat within those range boundaries. Amount of habitat is the 65% undisturbed habitat threshold that we've been talking about. And type of habitat, so these are biophysical attributes characterized by habitat type. So caribou may use different types of habitat at different times of year. They may use different types of habitat for calving or in, in the winter. And they may also use different types of habitat depending on the ecozone and the ecoregion that they occur within. And this is all broken down, there's an appendix in the recovery strategy that gets into the detail within each ecozone and ecoregion as to what the biophysical attributes are uh, for, for caribou within those areas. So what we want to do then is if we critical if we have a range where there's less than 65% undisturbed habitat, initially the critical habitat is existing habitat that over time would contribute to the attainment of at least 65% undisturbed habitat. If we have greater than or equal to 65% undisturbed habitat, we want to try to maintain at least 65% undisturbed habitat within the range. And we're also acknowledging that the precise location of the 65% undisturbed habitat is going to change over time, given the dynamic, dynamic nature of boreal forests. So areas that are uh, maybe good habitat now, maybe bad habitat uh, in the future, and the same thing is true that uh, habitat could come online Bad habitat that isn't used by caribou right now could come online as forests that mature over time. So this is sort of an example here uh, in a highly disturbed landscape of our sort of what we had originally looked at as critical habitat, what we're looking at now. So in the original proposed recovery strategy, on the left here, what we did is we had a um, 
we took out areas where there were fires. We took and we took out areas where there was uh, just what we call disturbed habitat, which was, which was anthropogenic habitat, and we had a 500 meter buffer around all of that. So instead, now what we're doing is we're we're looking at existing habitat, uh, which is everything minus permanent alterations. Uh, we're also saying that uh, the buffer could in fact be uh, critical habitat. The areas that have been burned could in fact be critical habitat because we have this idea where what we're aiming for here is that 65% of this area over time is going to be undisturbed habitat. So it's we're looking at it uh, differently than, than we did before. So then when we look at this, how to identify critical habitat, we're uh, acknowledging that there's this dynamic habitat condition and we no longer have this, like I just <coughs> tried to point out on the last slide, we no longer have this fixed idea of where uh, critical habitat is going to be. Uh, right now, in northern Saskatchewan, as I was mentioning earlier, because we have this area where we have high fire, low anthropogenic disturbance, we decided that we don't really have enough information right now to be able to identify critical habitat within that area. So we have no critical habitat in northern Saskatchewan. That's the only place where we haven't identified critical habitat. But we have said that we're going to have a, a schedule of studies and identify critical habitat in that area by 2016. And then this gets into the uh, idea of range plans. So range plans then are supposed to guide critical habitat protection based on local conditions. And so there, the, this implementation then of range level actions is going to be key for the recovery of boreal caribou. Range plans that are outlined how a given range is going to be managed to maintain or attain a minimum of 65% undisturbed habitat over time. Uh, once these range plans are in place, in theory, they could be adopted by the Minister of Environment as an action plan, or a bunch of them could be put together as an action plan under SARA. Uh, until a range plan is produced, which in the recovery strategy, we've, we've had a, a timeline of three to five years, then this initial definition of critical habitat, which I've gone into a bit here, is uh, going to be applied to the entire range, and the entire range has to be considered when assessing whether critical habitat is going to be destroyed by an activity. So activities that are likely to destroy critical habitat are activities that are going to result in habitat loss, uh, habitat degradation, or habitat fragmentation, and incur, occur in such a matter, uh, place and time, that after appropriate mitigation, they're going to compromise the ability of a range to be maintained at 65% undisturbed habitat, or compromise the ability of a range to be restored to 65% undisturbed habitat, or reduce connectivity within a range. So this is another sort of change in this new final recovery strategy that we have. We've identified that connectivity within a range is important as well. Um, the destruction of critical habitat can also occur if the, there's the increase of uh, predator and or alternate prey access to undisturbed areas. And if there's the removal or alteration of biophysical attributes that are nece necessary for survival of boreal caribou. Um, so activities may be able to occur if they're carried out in a way that allows boreal caribou to be self-sustaining and are not likely to result in the destruction of critical habitat. We also acknowledge in there that uh, cumulative effects have to be considered. So a single project or activity by itself may not result in destruction of critical habitat. But when considered in the context of all current and future development activities within a range, then the cumulative impacts may result in destruction of critical habitat. There's an there's a appendix in the recovery strategy as well that talks about mitigation techniques and ways to try to avoid destruction of critical habitat. The range plans then will identify range-specific activities likely to destroy critical habitat in line with those activities identified in the recovery strategy. So where we go from here then is, I mentioned this a lot already, is the development of these range plans and action plans by responsible jurisdictions, uh, which are mainly provinces and territories, although the action plans do have to be SARA compliant documents in order for them to be accepted by our minister. Ver uh, sorry, Environment Canada is going to continue to work closely with jurisdictions throughout the development of range plans and action plans. 
And we also uh, acknowledge that the Aboriginal people, stakeholders, and the public are going to be invited are important. Uh, they're important to uh, be involved and participate in this process of development for range plans and action plans.